were to show you an animal, could you tell me whether it is a vertebrate or an invertebrate? What is the difference between the two? Well, the clue is in the names. Vertebrates have an internal skeleton, also known as an endoskeleton, with vertebrae or backbones arranged in a spinal column. This internal skeleton provides support against gravity and allows vertebrates to reach large body sizes in terrestrial environments. On the other hand, invertebrates have no vertebrae and therefore no internal support structure. Instead, their support structure exists outside of their bodies. In many invertebrates, their surface is hardened and is called an exoskeleton. Vertebrate animals include fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. All other animals are considered invertebrates. Within the invertebrates, there is a group of animals known as arthropods. What are they? Well, the word arthropod is a combination of the Greek words arthron, meaning joint, and podos, meaning foot. Put together, the word arthropod refers to organisms with jointed feet or jointed appendages. These appendages are not only used for locomotion, but are also modified to form important structures, such as the antennae, mouth parts, and reproductive organs. Arthropods are among the most numerous organisms on the planet and have by far the most recognized species. To date, there are approximately 1.2 million known species of arthropods, and they make up more than 60% of all named organisms. Arthropods include animals such as crabs, lobsters, spiders, scorpions, millipedes, centipedes, and of course, insects. In addition to jointed appendages, all arthropods share a common body plan. This means that they all have bilateral symmetry, segmented bodies, ventral nerve cords, dorsal blood vessels, and exoskeletons. An organism shows bilateral symmetry if it can be split along only the anterior-posterior axis forming a single plane of symmetry that separates the body into left and right sides, as illustrated by this lobster. This is not unique to arthropods, but it is different from radial symmetry. Radial symmetry describes a body plan that has the general form of a cylinder, where any plane passing through the central axis creates two similar halves. Perfect radial symmetry is rare in nature. A jellyfish is a good example of an organism that comes close to having perfect radial symmetry, although technically it is quadriradial, as there are four axes along which it can be divided to form symmetrical mirrored halves. Because arthropods exhibit bilateral symmetry, like humans and other mammals, we can distinguish several axes along their bodies. There are three main axes you should be familiar with. The dorsal ventral axis, which runs from top to bottom. The anterior posterior axis, which runs from front to back. And the lateral axis, which runs from one side to the other. All arthropods have a segmented body plan. Adjacent segments are often fused into regions with specific biological functions. These regions are known as tagmata, and we will explore them in more detail when we examine the morphology of insects. Another common trait shared by arthropods is the ventral nerve cord. This differs from vertebrates, including humans, as our nerve cords are located along the dorsal side of our bodies. Furthermore, the nerve cords of arthropods are not enclosed in a protective spinal column like ours. Arthropods also have what is known as an open circulatory system, unlike vertebrates, whose circulatory system is closed. This means that arthropods don't have a network of blood vessels. Instead, they have a single dorsal blood vessel with large openings at either end. It circulates blood throughout the arthropod's body cavity, and tissues are directly exposed to the fluid. Finally, 
All arthropods have a stiff exoskeleton, which is made up of the cuticle and epidermis. The external non-living structure or cuticle is made up primarily of chitin and protein. The cuticle is composed of multiple layers, the waxy epicuticle, the exocuticle, and the endocuticle. A living cellular layer called the epidermis lies beneath and secretes the cuticle. A thin layer of tissue called the basement membrane lines the underside of the epidermis, separating it from the body cavity. The exoskeleton has many different roles. The outermost layer of the exoskeleton, the waxy epicuticle, helps prevent water loss and acts as a barrier against disease-causing pathogens. The exoskeleton provides protection and also has internal ridges that act as sites of muscle attachment and leverage. At the same time, it provides support for the internal organs. The exoskeleton is both a hard and flexible structure. How does it do this? Well, this has to do with the different layers that make up the exoskeleton. Specifically, the exocuticle layer is hardened through a process known as tanning, which in insects includes a cross-linking of proteins in the chitin protein matrix known as sclerotization. In some arthropods, tanning is sometimes achieved by mineralization or calcification. The deposition of minerals into organic tissues makes the exoskeleton strong enough to provide protection and support for the arthropod. Meanwhile, the unhardened endocuticle layer remains pliable and stretchy. Some parts of the cuticle between exoskeletal plates also may not be hardened, leaving these sections softer and more flexible. While the exoskeleton is an important adaptation in arthropod evolution, it also places constraints on the organisms. One of the biggest disadvantages of an exoskeleton is that it limits growth. As such, all arthropods need to molt as they develop an increase in size. Molting occurs when an arthropod sheds its old exoskeleton and replaces it with a new one. The entire process is regulated by hormones and consists of multiple steps. The first step in the molting process is called a polysis, which is the separation of the old cuticle from the underlying epidermal cells. This is caused by replication of the epidermal cells that are stimulated by ectosteroid molting hormone that is synthesized and released from endocrine glands called the prothoracic glands. A newly opened space under the old cuticle is created into which a digestive fluid flows. Enzymes in this digestive fluid become activated and break down the innermost endocuticle layer of the old cuticle into metabolites. These metabolites are then reabsorbed by the epidermal cells, which will use them to secrete the new cuticle. Once the new cuticle is fully formed, the arthropod pushes against the old cuticle and casts it off in a process referred to as ecdysis. When the arthropod first emerges from its old exoskeleton, the new cuticle is pale and soft. In order to increase its body volume and stretch the soft cuticle before it hardens, an arthropod will contract its muscles to increase internal fluid pressures within its body. The internal pressure can be further increased if the arthropod swallows air or water, inflating the gut to occupy more space in the body cavity. As with everything in nature though, there is a cost. And before the new cuticle hardens, the arthropod is extremely vulnerable to predation and desiccation. Now that we know what arthropods are, in the next video, we will see how they got here by examining their evolutionary history.